Yeah, Ukraine's the magic word today. And uh, Carl Baker is uh, here to help us uh, update on it and get current about what's happening, not happening, and, and how we can connect so many dots. Just when we were you know, thinking, well, maybe we can address the COVID now, or um, you know, this is even more aspirational. Why don't we try to address climate change? It's gonna ruin everything. Uh, then we get Ukraine, surprise, another fantastic global distraction. And it is distracting us a lot. And if you look at the press, you see there are various constituencies taking positions that are not necessarily the same. Uh, some of them are more in self-interest and some of them are less. There's the United States administration. There's the Democratic Party, the Republic, two, two factions of the Republican Party, the, the, the Doves and, and the, uh, the Hawks in the Republican Party. I should say the isolationists and the Hawks. Um, and then you get uh, the EU and you get Germany, which is a special case. You get Ukraine. They should be, we should consider them. And of course, you get Russia, which is mostly propaganda. Uh, wow, what a circus, Carl. Um, where do we start looking at this? Well, I think we start, uh, you know, where where we left off last time we talked about this, and that is, it's really important to make sure that the United States and NATO say the same thing. And actually, they've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, you know, today, the, the news, the news story for today is that, in fact, they uh, they both sent their written response to Russia, and they both were consistent in that they said, neither one of us is going to commit to uh, never, never admitting Ukraine or any other country for that matter into NATO, but we're not going to do it anytime soon. And, you know, and so that's, that's an important baseline for, for both NATO and the United States and NATO, I understand they're the same thing, but they also send separate responses. And, and so, uh, you know, so I think that's an important bottom line. And then I think the, they also agreed that there was some room to talk about, uh, arrangement of forces in in Europe. And so hearkening back to some of the things that they did back in the in the 1970s, uh, trying to trying to forecast exercises and be more transparent about what they're doing with forces moving around the, the, the region. So I think that that's, that's positive. It's not going to satisfy Russia because they want something like a guarantee, a security guarantee that says that that uh, NATO is going to pull back from the, the countries that they did put forces in and let join NATO since uh, 1990. So th that's not going to satisfy them. But I think there's room for some discussion at this point, at least uh, uh, as, as uh, Secretary of State Blinken said, we have given them a, an opportunity for a diplomatic solution. Well, I, um, but if, if that's, a, that's a hard position on both sides, uh, how do you how do you soften it? I mean, what what is the compromise on that? Um, guarantee that, uh, that, that NATO won't take them, or no guarantee? Um, it sounds very binary to me. What what is the compromise on that point? Well, the compromise is is that there's there's transparency, and that and that the, the United States and, and NATO are not going to accept Ukraine into into NATO for the foreseeable future, and and. Again, it's it's about what we're doing with with forces in in Europe in terms of transparency. So I think that that that's and and then a, another aspect of it was uh, some talk about resuming nuclear dialogue. And so understanding what what Russia's position is here, they they've said you need to pull back to to you know to to pre uh, collapse of the Soviet Union days. So so pre nineteen ninety basically and and. They know that the United States and NATO aren't going to sign up to that. So, so that doesn't come as a surprise, and that's not really binary. That's 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 binary on the part of Russia saying that that that's their demand. Uh, and th and then the other thing is is that is the United States ha has said that you know they're willing to talk about nuclear deployments. And, you know, and part of the part of the disagreement between the United States and Russia has still been that the United States still has these old uh, gravity nuclear weapons planted around Europe in different places, you know, and that that's 
partly, uh, you know, part of the part of the INF agreement that both sides that, that the United States walked away from during the Trump administration. But of course, it, it blamed Russia for violating it first. Mm -hmm. So again, all those 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 two areas really opened some room for for maneuver on both sides. Because mm -hmm. remember, uh, Russia Russia knows that that they're not going to get NATO or the United States to commit to never allowing the expansion of NATO. I mean, that's that, that's just completely inconsistent with, with the founding of NATO and completely inconsistent with concerns about European security. You know, this seems so different from Crimea. In Crimea, uh, my recollection is, fa is, is, is fading, but I don't think the US was very much involved in the Crimea event uh, we are involved in this one, though, and I guess that makes a big difference. Well, it makes a big difference, and it's also it also is different from Russia's side. Don't forget, Russia basically invaded Crimea without without much warning. This time, you know, they, they've first of all, Russia has said they're not going to invade uh, Ukraine. What they've said is that they've they've put forces in the border and and then made and then laid out the demands from for the United States and NATO to make some commitments about security in 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 continental Europe and uh, trying to force Ukraine back into negotiations. Remember, I, I I think you have to appreciate what Russia's real bottom lines are here, and and it's not actually the pullback of NATO as much as it is. Uh, having some some leverage over Ukraine in the Donbas region, you know, as, as we pointed out last time, you know, that Donbas region is is that eastern part of of the Ukraine that uh, is is largely largely Russian ethnic Russians that that live in that area, and those two the the two provinces in that area have both made an agreement. Part of the agreement in in uh, in the in the uh, agreement with uh, with Ukraine, was that those two provinces would be would be uh, have have some degree of, of separation from Ukraine itself, and so that's the, that's the region that Russia is really interested in. It's it's the Donbas region, you know, and and the the the, the 2015 agreement between the two really talked about that region. So so that's the region that Russia is really interested in. And I think if if Russia saw an opportunity, it would probably try to at least take some territory to to connect. Uh, that region into the into Crimea. I think yeah, that, that would, would be that some would be satisfaction. Good. That would be some satisfaction and justification yeah. of their efforts. Yeah. Can we see it? Can we see a map of the Ukraine? We have a map of Ukraine. And uh, I'd like to ask you about the Donbass and Kiev, because, um, you know, the media has said that there are Russian forces pointed at Kiev from the Belarus side or uh, yeah, I guess yeah, there, the border of Belarus and also from Russia. And it's a pincer movement, but I'm wondering how close Kiev is to the northeastern, you know, Donbass. Well, Don, Donbass is, is this eastern region on, on, on the on the on the eastern side of the, on the right hand side of the map, looking at it, and and then the, and then the forces in Belarus are are stationed up above Kiev, but th that isn't a big concentration. The big concentration is is in Russia, Russia proper. And, and and then of course Crimea and so and so what what Russia would like to do is they would like to to get some control over that part of Ukraine that's the area that's really being contested I think I think Russia realizes that that taking on a full invasion of Ukraine would would not be in their interest at this point I, and, well, and and it is different than when they went into Crimea because when they went into Crimea the Ukraine really had had a very ragtag force of a military. And since then, they've done a lot of work and, and NATO and the United States have done a lot of work with Ukraine to build up their, their military capabilities. So, so it is different from, from the days of, of, uh, of, of, of Crimea and, and Ukraine is a much, much more prepared today than it was back, in, back then. Yeah, I, I, I can recall $400 million that Trump was going to give them, and ultimately he did give them. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's not uh, Trump change. Uh, furthermore, you know, you have these weapons uh, piling up right now from the U.S. in, in uh, Ukraine, and uh, including uh, all kinds of uh, anti-air missiles and anti-tank missiles. And I wonder, my question to you, Carl, is uh, 
Does that does that really make Ukraine more powerful in this, you know, this hypothetical battle? Um, will they be able to uh, survive? Let me, uh, you know, if there is a war. And let me let me also ask: uh, How can you possibly give these high tech weapons uh, to Ukraine? Um, without giving them at least technical advisors, American technical advisors to show the Ukraine army and Air Force and what, how to use them. Well, there are technical advisors in Ukraine. There, there are NATO, NATO sponsored technical advisors there and, and US technical advisors there. So, so they do have that. And that is, that is part of those packages. So I mean, uh, uh, okay, it, would that be effective against Russia, or is it just? Well, a... sure, yeah, yes, no. It's it's not it's not just just window dressing. It is effective against Russia Russia's capabilities, and and that's why Russia would really would have to think very seriously about whether it's prepared to attack. And and you know those hundred and fifteen thousand. Uh, troops that they keep talking about in that region. They've been, they, they didn't just show up last week. You know, they, first of all, they've been talking about this since, since the middle of December. And, you know, and so there certainly is no surprise element left to, to a potential Russian attack. Again, I think, I think we really need to kind of cut through some of the, some of the propaganda, as you say, a lot of what's coming out of Russia's propaganda. You need to kind of sort through that and, and see what is it, what is it that, that Russia's real bottom line is. And, and just as, it, as it was before, the bottom line is still, they, if, if you talk to Russia, Russia was concerned about the, the Ukrainians using those new weapons to attack the, the Russian sympathizers in the Donbass. You know, so 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 basically, you know, you, you have you have the Russians saying we're really just trying to protect our interests in that region of Ukraine and the United States and and, and largely the United States. NATO, to a lesser degree, has has been screaming they're going to invade Iraq uh, they're going to they're going to invade uh, Ukraine so um you know I guess another constituency just to touch on it is uh, the Russian people because you know it's an autocratic government it's Putin when Putin decides he had for breakfast you know that's what counts um and query do they do they care about this do the people in the Donbass care about this or is it all him well actually actually I think the, the people in Donbass are are not all that set all that stuck on Ukraine, you know, they aren't that that's why that's why they're trying to develop some some level of understanding of what what that the provinces in Donbass really represent in terms of Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukrainian unity, because they they want to be separate, they want to to move toward toward Russia, while the rest of Ukraine, Kiev and, and the, the western part are interested in, in moving toward Europe. And so, so, so that's really the, the, the dynamic there is, is Russia sees the Donbass as, as very much part of the Russian sphere of influence, you know, and, and ultimately that's what, that's what I think Putin is looking for and, and the Russians are looking for is, is that that part of Ukraine really belongs to Russia. And, and if, if they could, if they thought they could move in and do that, I think they would, but I think they're, they're worried that they really don't have the capability to, to do that, especially, you know, given, given the statements that NATO and, and the United States have made about uh, no, no incursions into the Ukrainian territory. And that's why when, when Biden said, well, maybe a few, you know, that, that NATO and, and the State Department pushed back and said, no, zero is, is the right number. Um, I saw Tony Blinken say that, but, um, you know, uh, why now? You know, you talk about, you know, things that are in place, phenomenon that have been going on for a long time, mm -hmm. um, you know, feelings, um, you know, economic considerations, long time. Why now? Well, I think Putin saw it as an opportunity. I mean, the world is distracted with other things. The United States is, is wanting to, to shift to Asia and, and come you know, the competition with China. And, and so, you know, so there's, there's, uh, it's, it's winter. And so oil and or natural gas specifically, is in short supply in, in Europe. And so this is an opportunity to kind of use that leverage that they have uh, over over Europe, and, and especially Germany, you know, so so that's, that's another consideration. And, and, you know, another, another part of it is, like I said, 
Russia saw, saw Ukraine developing capabilities that threatened their ability to, to continue to have some say in what happens in the Donbass. And so, you know, so that's, that, you know, that's part of the Minsk Accords that, that uh, Ukraine has not followed through on. And so, again, I think that's another factor in Russia's calculus to say we need to do something now rather than later before Ukraine becomes even stronger and, and is capable of, of better defending it. Moving west uh, to Ukraine itself, mm -hmm. uh, two, two or three remarkable things have happened in the past week or so. The one that really interests me is, is Zelensky said, now, now, just relax, everybody. Um, you know, you, we're not at risk of imminent attack. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't uh, hoard food and supplies. Uh, let's just go about our business. That's the one thing he said. And in connection with that, he also said, you know, they have these tents with their ostensible um, troop gathering on the border. But our information is that the tents are only half filled. <laughs> And they suggest there's all these troops there, but they're not really there. <laughs> I love that kind of propaganda. Um, what do you think about that, Carl? I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I have no idea what what that what that means. You know, you, you have to kind of accept what he's doing as as trying to trying to calm down a country that that hears the, the Western media saying we're going to war they're they're you know they're they're on the border and they're poised to to pounce in a pincer move uh, you know from three directions and and all that so I mean if you're Zelensky you know you have a you have a domestic constituency that that is going to panic you know, uh, you know, I guess they have the same problem that uh, we do with uh, people running to the store for rice and uh, toilet paper the first th first time they hear there's a problem in the world. You know? yeah. So, you know, so I think that that's that's quite understandable that he would do that. And, you know, and, and so it's, it's not it's not an unreasonable thing for him to do, you know, and, and if you're Ukraine. You know, I mean, everybody learns from this from this process of of where they stand in relation to the others. Because uh, I mean, you, I, I could make I, I would make the argument that 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 Putin has done this, and remember, he has been silent on it since late December. He has not said anything. He has just let the Western media ramble on and on about what's happened. And 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 he, he's taking this in, evaluating what it really means. You know, so so I mean, what he's doing. You know, he shores up he shores up Russian legitimacy by saying, I've gotten I've gotten Biden to talk to me as a, as an individual. You know, I've gotten a bilateral with the United States. So Russia, Russia's legitimized in, in that process. You know, the other thing he, he's trying to do, I think, is, you know, present himself as the successor to the Soviet Union. That's why he goes back and he says, you know, we need to we need to roll back NATO NATO advancement uh, back to the back to 1990. Well, you know, NATO is not leaving Poland. It's not leaving Romania. It's not leaving the Baltics. You know, it, it's it's there. It's not it's not going to move back. And so, he, you know, he's 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 playing to his domestic audience too. You know, and and you know, and and basically, he's he's watching the paranoia in the West, and and he, he's he's really playing on 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 inconsistencies in the in the NATO commitments and and the U, and the disagreements between NATO and and the United States specifically Germany as you mentioned at the, at the opening you know Germany has has said well we're not going to send weapons to Ukraine we're not we're not we're we're not going to just give up and and stop taking uh, natural gas from Europe you know they're they're hesitant to make any any firm commitments about the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline yet you know because they're they're in a they're in a pinch uh, for for uh, fuel you know so 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 I think that that's another aspect of it. And then and then the other th other thing is, is, you know, he 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 reminds Ukraine that you go ahead and be on be with the West, but you better understand you're on your own because all these guys are telling you, look, we'll we'll help Ukraine, but we're not going to send troops into Ukraine to fight Ukraine's wars. So, you know, so so Putin Putin is a, has has already taken enough wins in this that he can he can walk away. And and you know, with his closed media, he doesn't have to worry about any backlash for how much it costs to put those troops out on the border. Whether it's you know whether it's 115 or there's really only half that many out there, it it, it doesn't really matter to him, you know. But but he he can take it away as a win, saying I've done all these things. I've I've re I've reaffirmed 
the, the, the relevance of, of Russia to European security? Well, I would be impressed, and I think there's a fair chance that he will get more territory out of this without firing a shot. And he will get more influence out of it without firing a shot. Who knows how much he'll get out of it? But, you know, I would suspect he's not going to fire a shot. And, um, you know, and that takes me to the question of this, uh, this effort that was reported about um, bringing someone in to take Zelensky's place a yeah. pro-Russian leader. Uh, what was that about? Was that propaganda or, or more? I, I, I don't know. I mean, it came out of, it came out of British intelligence. You know, the, the story came out of British intelligence. So why did British intelligence uh, put that out in the public? Uh, you know, it's, it's another one of those variables that, that without, without some kind of inside information, you're really guessing at what it meant. I mean, because it certainly would be a copy of what happened in Belarus. Remember, I mean, that's, you know, that's how, how Belarus fell back into, into Russian control, is they, they basically replaced the, the, the leader in Belarus and put in, put in a, a friend of, of Putin. So it certainly is a plausible, it's a, it's a plausible scenario, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I'm at a loss to say the, the validity because I simply don't have the information to, to, to know can't, can't, the moving to your comments on Germany, you know, actually, we ended the last discussion we had, Carl, on the fact that Biden's best move was to, you know, ally with Europe. To, to, it has to be multi, multilateral with Europe and try to get them, you know, activated uh, behind us somehow or with us. Um, but, but Germany is in a different spot. And, um, and if it's about gas... We have gas and we could sell them gas. Have, have we been able to soften the risk of, of Germany losing gas? Yeah, that's one of the things that, that, that Biden has done and, and beyond just our gas, but they've also been working with UAE in the Middle East to, to reassure Germany that in fact, there are other sources. Of course, it's not as cheap and it's not as easy because you basically have to liquefy it and, and bring it over in ships rather than a pipeline, which is much more efficient and, and ultimately cheaper. So yeah, no, they've, they've done that. You know, and, and back, to the, back to the general point that you're making uh, uh, about the, the need for, for coherence. As I, as I said at the beginning, uh, the United States of NATO have done a pretty good job, I think, of, of sticking together and, and more or less a unified front. Of course, you know, Olaf Scholz has got, I mean, he's new, you know, so this is another, another test that, that I'm sure Putin is watching carefully of how, of how Scholz actually responds. You know, now that Merkel is gone and, and Chancellor Scholz is, is in the seat, you know, this is really his first, his first threat of, of, Russia doing this. And so, you know, I think they're, they're watching him as well of, of what he's doing. But, you know, what the West could have done better, I'll say, is they, they could have showed a more unified front. They, they, could have, they could have worked it out, you know, in quiet between the United States and Germany to, to be more, more solidified and, and avoided this whole, this whole public discussion about sanctions and, you know, and all the, all the differences and, and instead of in doing it more private. You know, and, and Germany did. Germany sent the foreign minister to to Moscow for private talks rather than, you know, doing it via the airways, which which is always uh, cumbersome and, and lends itself to propaganda and misinformation. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing it did is it really rewarded bad behavior by Putin. You know, instead of instead of going up front early with Biden agreeing to talk to, to Putin, they would have been better off saying, here's your reward. If, if you're willing to, to come to some compromise, then you can talk to Biden. Then you get the, then you get the bilateral with the United States. But first you, you deal with NATO. So they could have done that better. And then, you know, that, the, the, other, the other thing is, is that they, they didn't really do a particularly good job of including Ukraine. Biden said, Every, if it's about Ukraine, we're going to include Ukraine. But you know, as, as Zelensky said, look, if, if you're in, in Ukraine, there is no small incursion. <laughs> there's only there's only incursions, you know, <laughs> you know, so so it, it, it could have done better, but it didn't do badly either. You know, there there is some positive about it that that they were able to maintain a fairly coherent uh, 
position, they, they both delivered their message to, to Russia, uh, you know, saying, yes, we're, we, we, we realize that, that Russia has an interest in European security. You know, that's ultimately what all that stuff means about willing to talk about nuclear deployments and, and positioning of forces and transparency and all that. So, you know, so I think that, that overall, it, they've done a pretty good job. And, and I think we are, in fact, coming to, to an, uh, an end game here now that they've delivered the written responses to Russia. And I think what we'll see that, that there is, there is some, some room for compromise and, and I think diplomacy will, will win the day. And, and Russia is probably not going to. Of course, you know, you, you're, you're always at risk when you say Russia's not going to invade because that's, that's sort of a fool's, a fool's statement. But I think you can certainly say that, that it's, it, it doesn't seem very likely. Well, okay, I want to move further west. I want to move to the United States here for a minute because, um, you know, Biden did not have a good, um, what do you want, experience in Afghanistan uh, mm -hmm. in terms of his popularity. He's still suffering from that. Um, right now, his, his popularity, even among Democrats, is low. And of course, during, you know, with the GOP, it's lower yet. As I mentioned earlier, the GOP seems to be split between hawks and, and uh, isolationists, uh, which is interesting. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if, uh, how you could say what the Democratic group is thinking. Uh, I guess they're really interested in not putting boots on the ground. But one thing is clear. This is a test as far as the political environment is concerned in this country and maybe in the world sort of as a global beyond the eu sort of a global statement of just effective how effective is joe biden and his administration in dealing with complex and risky problems yeah. um so you know he he's really under a microscope now and it's not at all clear that he has the support of the country well, yeah, because you don't know which country he's uh, trying to get support from at this point. I mean, that's that's part of the problem. But, you know, I, Paul Waldman had a had a good piece in The Washington Post today about. The Ameri Americans tend to try to reduce everything to is he showing strength or is he showing weakness, you know, and trying to trying to reduce it to that binary. And I don't think that's very helpful, you know, and so that's 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 a part of his problem is is. Everybody thinks, you know, that the American president has to project weakness or strength, you know, and, and weakness is always defined as not taking a belligerent approach. And and I think that in this case, you know, Biden hasn't taken a very belligerent approach. You know, he's been he's been fairly measured in everything he's done. And he hasn't said we're going to send, you know, we're going to send troops tomorrow and we're going to deploy a, a, a tank battalion and all that. You know, he's been he's been very measured in what he's done. And so I think that 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 to me is success but to other people in the united states as you say that's not success because because he's he demonstrated weakness and then you get all this chatter about uh, you know appeasement and you know it's just like chamberlain and you know all that all that sort of noise that that you, you get whenever whenever the united states doesn't try to be strong whatever that whatever that means in terms of uh, of, of sure. United States action. And normally, it means let's send the military and uh, you know throw throw the military at it and think that solves the problem because that shows strength. So I think you know I think that that yes, part of the problem is is how do you define success in this case? And I think again, you know, as 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 I said as I said the last time, we're past the unipolar moment, and we have to recognize that we need to have a, a consistent solidified position that is comfortable for both the United States and for Europe. You know, we somehow the, the, the possibility of war looms large in all of this. And yet, uh, I want to raise one more thing. And, and that is, uh, Russia has been effective in using cyber attacks against its neighbors, against mm -hmm. Ukraine, um, and other countries uh, there uh, who worry about further cyber attacks from Russia. It's mm -hmm. part of the Russian approach. Uh, it's sort of like radioactive poison, you know? It's part of the Russian approach. <laughs> yeah. So at the same time, 
um, you know, maybe it's just the press, but there has been some rhetoric about how the United States has some remarkable cyber attack uh, capabilities, uh, and they could do the same thing in, in, in return. So what we might have is a whole brand new experience. It's not with troops. It's not boots on the ground. It's not even bombs and artillery and mortars and drones. It's cyber attacks. And I think that's waiting in the wings. How, how important is that in this kind of confrontation and confrontations like this later? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's that is a new reality that that people face. And, you know, again, I think Ukraine has 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 done a, a fairly good job of, of re responding to those kinds of threats, you know, and, and the United States is is learning that 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 is a potential and it is a, a risk that you have with 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 uh, with Russia and, and to some extent with China. I think Russia is probably a little more aggressive in, in that area than than the, than the Chinese are, at least in in terms of offensive capabilities. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 clear. And, and, and again, cyber, you know, cyber has taken on this this sort of broad definition of of both influence operations as well as as actually you know trying to damage uh, infrastructure and things like that and i think that that certainly russia is is in the business of disinformation you know i, I mean that that is that is very clear they they've uh, are certainly the ones that have probably come the closest to uh, to perfecting that that art form uh, in, in terms, especially in, in the Donbass and, and in, in Kiev itself, I think. And that's why, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Zelensky has to has to really calm the people in, in Ukraine because that they are very effective in their disinformation campaigns. Yeah, if you divide your the public of your adversary, if you divide the country from its administration, um, you're weakening it. I don't know, he's trying to do that in the U.S. for sure. One thing you mentioned early on in this discussion, Carl, was the idea that um, Putin saw this as op uh, opportunistic. Indeed, it's, it's clear. Um, and the U.S. was, um, you know, engaged, uh, trying to, you know, protect its interests in Asia, uh, advance its influence, whatever, or pr protect its influence in Asia. And so um, maybe we were distracted with that and he thought he'd take advantage. But now all, all the oxygen is on is on the eastern frontier. Uh, every day, the press, how many people are writing uh, fact and an opinion about this? It's like the, all the oxygen in the room is, is going to uh, Putin and his adventures. Um, but how does this is a really interesting thought. How, how, how does that affect our initiative in Asia? And, and how does it affect Xi Jinping, who is also an opportunist? Yeah, I, I mean, I... I... I don't quite know how to answer that because I, I don't know that there's that close of a connection. I mean, yeah, the, the media has has taken this on as a as a big project, and and certainly you know the U.S. government has spent a lot of energy on this on this problem. But in terms of of a broader long term strategy, you know this is this is sort of a a couple month annoyance. And, and like I said, I think we're approaching the end game. And so I, I, I don't see I don't see Xi Jinping taking advantage of it. You know, there's been uh, some of the some of the stuff that people have been writing about why why Russia won't invade is because the Olympics are coming up, and and Putin doesn't want to uh, destroy uh, Xi Jinping's Olympics uh, with a war in in Europe. And whether that's good analysis or not, I'll, I'll leave to to you, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I just don't I don't see that as as in, in Xi Jinping's calculus. You know, I, I think we've I've said before when we when we talked about Russia, yeah, you know, uh, Russians, Russians play chess and they and they like to do full frontal in your face kind of attacks on the on the queen, you know, where China plays Wei Qi, you know, they 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 like to do encirclement and 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 grab you around the edges and, and do do feints and, and and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I think that that, that the, the strategies don't aren't all that compatible when it comes to to one playing off the other, I don't think. Last uh, last area of inquiry, just for a minute or two. It just seems to me that so much of this is unprecedented. 
I mean, you try to find some historical reference and, and nothing applies directly. Um, you know, of course, the history creates the environment for these things to happen. But these things, these events, these strategies, the clever moves or maybe not so much clever moves um, are, you know, kind of a new world, a new world of diplomacy, a new world of confrontation. It's hard to find a parallel. And I'm, I'm thinking that there's a lot of lessons in here um, as to how things are going to go in the future. Uh, telecommunications brings us closer. Uh, the media brings us closer and is a wild card everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of confrontation is likely to happen again. And we should all be learning a lot from how it is unfolding. Am I right? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think it's honestly, I don't think it's all that unprecedented. I mean, we've we've had these kinds of confrontations with Russia before. You know, I mean, if you go back into the into the 70s and 80s, you know, or look at the 1960s, you know, when when they, when they when the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and by knew, the way, I knew you were going to mention that, Kurt. you know, and by the way, you know, there, there actually has been some analysis that uh, when, when Russia says they're going to take technical military means what they're really talking about is moving troops into Venezuela and Cuba, <laughs> you know, that, that they're going to they're going to say, well, if you think you can put weapons on our front door, we're going to put weapons on your front door. Oh, so, God. you know, so so in some respects, you know, yeah, history, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes, you know, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll take that as as the response to, to, to that. And, and ho hopefully we won't have another Cuban Missile Crisis in 2022. <laughs> hopefully. Well, at least we would like it to rhyme anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Great discussion. I look forward to following up on this uh, with further discussions about this and, and, and the echoes of it in, in various places in the world. Is there anything you want to leave with our, with our viewing audience as to an expectation here? Yeah, don't expect complete success expect expect it to to continue to be an iterative process and that if we can get past this 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 current crisis then hopefully we can begin some level of dialogue and a movement toward some level of accommodation with russia and russia's interests protected and europe's europe's interests protected as well on an ongoing basis is what i hear you're saying yeah it's not just one one show, one crisis. It's uh, establishing, uh, nurturing, uh, fashioning a relationship that will be better going forward. Right. And, and, and it's centered in Europe. It's not centered on the United States and Russia. Yeah. Thank you so much. Carl Baker, a senior advisor to Pacific Forum. Thank you so much. Thank you.